Hello, my name is Paige Cowell and I'm a research biologist with Ducks Unlimited Canada's Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research, or IOWR for short. I'm currently based near Stonewall, Manitoba, Canada at the national headquarters of Ducks Unlimited Canada. Today I'll be sharing the results from a massive freshwater coastal marsh restoration project undertaken by Ducks Unlimited Canada called Restoring the Tradition at Delta Marsh. This is a marsh that has faced similar issues as those at Emaquan with invasive carp causing habitat degradation. And although I'm presenting today, this project had many partners and collaborators that were involved with this work, and it wouldn't have been possible uh, without them. So I just wanted to say a quick thank you to these folks up on the screen. And I also wanted to mention that the water clarity and vegetation work I'll be presenting on has been published in the Journal of Frontiers as open access. And the waterfowl results have just recently been published in the Journal of Wetlands. So this presentation is about the restoration efforts at Delta Marsh, which is about 18,500 hectares in size. I'd like to start first by acknowledging that Delta Marsh is located within the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. In the spirit of reconciliation, we respectfully acknowledge these nations as the original caretakers of this land. So Delta Marsh is located in Manitoba, Canada, on the south shore of Lake Manitoba. You can see in the inset map, the red hatch box just north of Portage La Prairie outlines the location of Delta Marsh. This marsh is connected to Lake Manitoba by four channels, which allow for the passage of water as well as fish once the frozen marsh thaws in the springtime. Now, Delta Marsh was formerly a premier waterfowl staging area that was very popular with outdoors people. However, the marshes face a number of threats upsetting its ecosystem, including stabilized water levels through lake level regulation, nutrient loading from the surrounding agriculture lands, and invasive species such as hybrid cattail and common carp. By the 1970s, outdoors people and researchers became alarmed by the increasingly turbid waters, declining submerged aquatic vegetation, and decreasing waterfowl numbers they were observing. And so that's why this project is titled Restoring the Tradition, so that it might once again support large numbers of waterfowl through the restoration of this critical Delta Marsh habitat. So out of all of the threats to Delta Marsh that I mentioned in the previous slide, carp seemed like a probable major cause of the marsh's decline and also potentially the easiest for us to address. Uh, carp are problematic because they migrate from Lake Manitoba into the marsh during the spring and through their feeding and spawning activities, they uproot submerged aquatic vegetation and disturb sediments which perpetuates the cycles of loss of vegetation, declining water clarity, and algae blooms. So for this project, the goal was to restore a critical habitat of Delta Marsh and return it to its former place as one of North America's premier waterfowl staging marshes. We operated under the hypothesis that Common carp are a major cause of decline of waterfowl habitat, specifically through the decline of submerged aquatic vegetation. So phase one of this project was the monitoring of the marsh pre-carp exclusion in order to collect baseline data that we could compare post-carp exclusion conditions to. Phase two of the project involved the actual installation of carp exclusion structures and the subsequent monitoring of the impacts of the operation of these structures. So this included the monitoring of effects on fish to satisfy regulatory requirements. And it also resulted in a few graduate research projects that took an extensive look at the marsh nutrient budget to determine 
to what extent nutrient loading was a problem, and to inform future management actions if needed. And finally, to evaluate our own objective of improving waterfowl habitat, we were particularly interested in monitoring changes in water clarity, submerged aquatic vegetation, and the response of waterfowl, of course. So to gauge the quality of marsh habitat, we were able to leverage historical data on SAV, or submerged aquatic vegetation, and waterfowl abundance and we also used water clarity measures from pre-carp exclusion years. So carp exclusion structures and screen culverts were constructed at the connections between Lake Delta Marsh and Lake Manitoba, and they were placed so that the carp would be excluded from pretty much all of the marsh, except for Clarendaboy Bay, which is at the very east end of Delta Marsh. In the winter of 2012 and 2013, sheet pile exclusion structures were constructed between the marsh and the lake. So here you can see the dewatered channel and the welding of our Cram Creek structure with openings that would eventually allow for the passage of water and fish. And this is what the structures look like now. So this is our largest structure on Waterhen Creek. They're operated to reduce carp access to the marsh while minimizing impacts on native fish species. There are screens that are dropped into the openings in the spring after most native fish species peak migrations into the marsh are complete. The bars of these screens are spaced 70 millimeters apart, which allows native fish through as most of the native fish species have slimmer body profiles than the large bodied common carp. And these screens are then pulled midsummer after most spawning has been completed. And this just lowers um, upkeep and cleaning of the screens that needs to happen. Now I'm gonna show you the next uh, video, which will demonstrate what it looks like when there's the peak carp migrations and they're trying to enter the marsh but the screens are in these structures and they are blocking the common carp from entering Delta Marsh. So you can see the camera showing the lake side of the structure. There's this big pile up of common carp that are trying to enter Delta Marsh. And then the camera is going to pan over to the marsh side of the structure and you can see what a difference what a difference there is there. So quite dramatic. And although it's not the focus of the topic here today, Knowing whether the exclusion of large carp was sex successful is central to interpretation of our results. After exclusion efforts began, there was an overall 52 to 64% decline in relative abundance of large carp wider than 70 millimeters. And that depends on whether you're using gill netting or electrofishing catch data to calculate those abundances. Now, although this figure is of gill netting catch per unit effort and not relative abundance, you can see by the red line that large carp catch per unit effort was significantly reduced between the pre and post carp exclusion time periods. And the blue line here shows that outside of the carp exclusion zone, there was no significant change in catch per unit effort of large carp. So now I'd like to get into the changes in habitat we observed in response to this carp exclusion. We monitored water clarity at Delta Marsh before and after carp exclusion to see if there were any improvements. You can see on the map on the screen here, our water sample locations are distributed across the west and east marsh units. The black dots show our sample locations and the red dots show where the carp exclusion structures are located. 
Because the East Marsh is such a large area, it was analyzed as two separate units, what we ended up calling East 1 and East 2. The division between these two units occurs at a natural and nearly midway point of the East Marsh. We decided to use inorganic suspended solids, or ISS, uh, and total chlorophyll uh, as measures of water clarity, and then we compared the pre and post carp exclusion period results. Now, using data from all water sample sites, we observed an overall decrease in inorganic suspended solids after carp exclusion began, and this decrease was by about 32%. And the decline in inorganic suspended solids was spatially dependent, with a significantly larger decrease in the west unit in red up on the graph. And that decrease was by about 59% relative to the inconclusive changes in the east units. And so we speculate that the spatially dependent decrease in ISS was more pronounced in the west unit because it consists of much smaller bays, meandering channels, and is overall more sheltered from wind and wave action. So that, coupled with carp exclusion, likely contributed to the larger reduction in suspended solids over in the west unit of the marsh. And there was some indication of declines in total chlorophyll, but these were inconclusive due to high variability in the data. So, some evidence towards total chlorophyll declines and hence uh, phytoplankton declines, but they just were not statistically significant uh, declines. Now I'm going to get it more into the meat and potatoes of this because we know that submerged aquatic vegetation is a big focus of this project. Uh, we know that carp have direct effects on it and SAV is essential to waterfowl habitat. We used historical SAV survey data, as well as mapped SAV in post-carp exclusion years within the same transects that are used for the aerial waterfowl surveys. And we then compared the before and after results in submerged aquatic vegetation. Here you can see the decline of total submerged aquatic vegetation in each marsh unit. So red is west, blue is east one, and gray is east two. So you can see from the earliest survey in 1974, the declines in SAV continued through to the 1997 and 2009 surveys. And another way to visualize the changes in SAV extent is the view of one of these survey transects through time. Green is SAV, blue is unvegetated water, and white is land over on the right hand side of your screen. So you can see by 2009 there is hardly any submerged aquatic vegetation left. And then in post carp exclusion years you can see the increase in extent. In 2018, much of Delta had SAV extents similar to the 19, 1970s levels, which was our overall goal. The West and East two units in particular showed large increases, while the more wind exposed East one unit has not rebounded similar, similarly. All right, now to get to our ultimate goal, which was to um, improve marsh habitat conditions uh, with the goal of increasing the number of waterfowl, sorry, the number of fall staging ducks back to those historical 1970s levels. So this was done using waterfowl count data and looking at the waterfowl associations with SAV. So waterfowl using the marsh in the fall were counted through uh, waterfowl, aerial waterfowl surveys where an airplane was flown over these transects you can see up on the screen um, and several surveys were conducted each fall. 
Fortunately, we were then able to compare the historical survey data that was collected between 1965 and 2012 uh, for pre-CARP exclusion uh, time periods. And then we could compare that historical data to survey data collected after CARP exclusion began. And after scaling densities to marsh area, we found that the total daily diving duck abundance at Delta Marsh was at its lowest in the 2000s, but then it rebounded to historical 1990, sorry, 1970s levels after carp exclusion began. We also found that within marsh spatial distribution of diving ducks was primarily influenced by submerged aquatic vegetation presence and the distance to the nearest hunting access point as well. Now I'm going to highlight the results of two species of diving duck in particular that have historically been important at Delta Marsh, the canvasback and lesser scop. Total daily canvasback abundance at Delta Marsh ranged from its lowest levels in the 1990s and 2000s to its highest levels in post-carp exclusion years, so after those carp exclusion structures went in. Total daily scop abundance at the marsh ranged from its lowest levels in the 2000s to levels similar to that of the 1970s after carp exclusion efforts began. So I've thrown a lot of stuff at you and I just wanted to go through a summary of these results once again and just reiterate those main points. So we were successful in limiting large common carp access to the marsh, which resulted in increased water clarity through the reduction in inorganic suspended solids, although not all parts of the marsh responded equally, we do recognize. And submerged aquatic vegetation area increased to historical levels in many areas of the marsh, with direct disturbance of common carp likely the main reason for these changes in the SAV. And finally, the response we are most interested in was the return to historic levels in the number of ducks using the marsh during fall migration. These duck increases were also in association with SAV, suggesting that improvements in SAV was what was driving the duck response. So the take home message here is even with partial exclusion of large carp, uh, there can be large changes experienced in the ecosystem. Uh, partial exclusion can be very impactful even in large and complicated wetlands such as Delta Marsh. Now I'll close off by just saying that carp exclusion involves modifying fish habitat, which in Canada falls under federal jurisdiction. After presenting the results of our monitoring program in 2021 to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they then signed off on the continued operation of the carp exclusion structures, which are operated each spring to this day. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation today.